In this video, I'm going to introduce you to the idea of invariant subgroups, factor groups, homomorphisms, and isomorphisms. So, you know, this is these are quite a few different uh, sort of concepts, but this is just a brief introduction, and you will get sort of an idea of what they are so that when we use these things in future videos, uh, you will have sort of a, an intuitive understanding of what I'm talking about. So it can be shown from the results in the previous video that if we have uh, these elements right here that are each an element of our group G, uh, where two of them using our binary operation gives us another member of that group, then if we do this where we surround each one with elements from our group, I guess I could put that that uh, our R here, our R is also an element of our group. And so we can do this for sort of any elements R of our group and we should get the same thing. So if we have this equal to this, then surrounding each one of them with those elements will get us the same thing. And so we can use our example of the C3V group here where I'm taking uh, a sigma 2, sigma 1, and having that be equal to C3, which we can get from the table. Uh, but if we do each one of these in succession, so we first want to do C or sigma 2 on C3, and so we can look at our table over here. So sigma 2 uh, on C3 is sigma 1, and so we can put a, a C3 three bar sigma uh, sigma one here then sigma one on c3 here so sigma one on c3 is sigma three so we have our c3 bar sigma three then c3 on c3 is our c3 bar so we have c3 bar C3 bar. Uh, and so now if we take each of these, so C3 bar on C3 bar uh, is going to give us C3. So, uh, so I'll move it over here. So we'll have equal to C3. Uh, this second one here, C3 bar on sigma 3. So we go to C3 bar uh, down to sigma 3. So let's say sigma 2. So let's say sigma 2 here. Uh, then we have C3 bar on sigma 1. So we have C3 bar on sigma 1. So let's say sigma 3. So sigma 3. So then sigma 3 on sigma 2. So we have sigma 3. We acted on sigma 2 and we get C3. And so we see that uh, even when we surrounded these things, we still ended up getting something that was equal to something else in our group. And so uh, that shows that this actually works, this surrounding these things with other elements of the group. All right, and so if we have uh, this, so this x uh, sub k uh, equals x sub j with surrounded by two elements of the group, and then x sub j is equal to x sub i surrounded by two elements of the group, then sort of a transitive property here, we have our x sub i surrounded by two elements, and then that whole thing is surrounded by two elements and that will be equal to x sub k. So it's sort of a transit, transitivity of, uh, of x sub k equaling this x sub j, which is sort of everything here, and then x sub j equaling this x sub i, which is everything in parentheses here. Uh, and so I show down here uh, how that works. So we first do the part inside parentheses that gives us the x sub j, it's surrounded by our R, so that gives us the X sub K. And so we can define uh, this T as S, uh, then the inverse of R. And so an example from our C3V is this. So we have our C3 bar here surrounded by sigma 1s, and then that whole thing is surrounded by sigma 3s. And so this thing in parentheses here gives us a C3, and we do the C3 on the sigma 3 there, and we get this. We do the sigma 3 on the sigma 1 there, and we get the C3 bar. Uh, and so that works for our our example group here. Uh, and so where we now have this T equals the sigma 1, sigma 3, which is equal to C3, and then this, uh, this T inverse is 
uh, just the inverse of this or uh, sort of moving those around and so we have this and so that is equal to C3 bar and so we can do that same thing again here we get C3 bar C3 bar C3 uh, C3 bar C3 is E and that's C3 bar on E so that gives us C3 bar which is the same as what we had up here and so we see how that can work with our example group here uh, and so it is also possible to have conjugate subgroups where uh, our our subgroup here is surrounded by these elements of our group here is equal to uh, this conjugate subgroup here. Uh, and so conjugate uh, subgroups uh, is something I talked about in the previous video. And so uh, we can have this co uh, collection of elements itself as a subgroup with the same multiplication table as H. Uh, but then there's this special case where our conjugate subgroup is just equal to the subgroup that we used to make the conjugate subgroup from. And so this conjugate subgroup is an invariant or sometimes called normal subgroup. And so for the C3V example, uh, we have this subgroup here, and that one is invariant because we see when we do each element in here surrounded by these uh, these R's here, so every element of the group, uh, we end up with these three columns here from, in, from this table from my last video. And we see we end up with only elements of our subgroup and so we put those together into uh, into a subgroup because these are all the sort of distinct members that we get from doing the, the this uh, conjugate uh, subgroup here and so we end up with the same subgroup so the conjugate subgroup is the same as the subgroup and so that makes it an invariant or normal subgroup uh, so yeah, that's just what I said here. So the other subgroups of the C3V are not invariant since uh, if we did the conjugate of sigma 1, we would get sigma 3 here, which is not a member of this subgroup. Uh, and so this subgroup, and the same would be true for uh, the, the identity element in sigma 2, the identity element in sigma 3 subgroups. So those are not invariant subgroups. All right, and then so using the invariant, the invariant subgroup and the cosets of the invariant subgroup, uh, these can be made into a new group of their own. And so now we're actually making a group out of the subgroups. And so we're making uh, a group out of elements and these elements actually are groups themselves and so that's actually what we're going to be doing here uh, and so for instance the invariant subgroup of G that we'll call H sub n uh, was this which I talked about above is an element where the set uh, is regarded as a single element and another element is our uh, right coset so the invariant subgroup uh, with this sigma 1 on the right of it which gives us this which then when we perform those operations it gives us this and so what we see here is that uh, we can make a new group operation that actually looks like this uh, and so this here is an element, this H uh, invariant, this H invariant uh, here with the, uh, or the right coset of the invariant subgroup. And putting those together with this uh, binary operation gives us this uh, right coset of our invariant subgroup, where evidently the H sub uh, in, or the invariant subgroup, is the identity element, since uh, when we do our our binary operation with that onto this member here of our sort of higher level group, it just gives us that same member of the higher level group. Uh, and so more generally, any invariant subgroup H uh, H sub n uh, is in this distinct cosets uh, makes a new group 
of order n where each coset is an element of that group. So these elements, each containing a number of elements themselves, are called complexes. And so each one of these things which are acting as elements of this sort of, uh, this sort of higher level group are called a complex. Uh, and the group which they compose is called a factor group uh, or a quotient group. So the book I'm using uh, for this playlist, they, uh, the author calls it a factor group, but I believe the Wikipedia page for it is called the quotient group. And it's denoted this G forward slash H. And so uh, once again, just pay attention to the fact that it's a forward slash instead of the backslash. So it's not the elements of G that are not in the subgroup H. This is a forward slash. And so this is essentially just a name, uh, a name for this sort of higher, uh, this higher order group here. Uh, and so these factor groups uh, are what are known as homomorphisms. Uh, and so our C3V group, we can make a uh, homomorphism where we take this, uh, this right here, which was uh, one of our, our classes, and then this here, which was our other class. And we can actually map those, uh, this one onto positive one and this one onto negative one. And so it gives us this same table. And so the table will be the same even if you took uh, any element from this group out and, and any element from this group out and acted them on each other, uh, you would get something. Uh, so if you acted one from plus one with one from minus one, you would get something from minus one because we see that that is sort of like taking one times minus one, which gives us minus one. So it would give us something from the uh, class of that we are mapping to minus one, where, you know, if we took uh, two from our one group here and acted them on each other, we would get this positive one. And if we took two from our uh, minus group here together and acted them on each other, it would give us something from the one that we mapped to positive one. And so this is a homomorphism, which uh, the, 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 the thing to notice for this, it is, it is, uh, not not one to one and so we are mapping multiple things onto one and multiple things onto minus one uh, yeah and so this is just looking at uh, each of these things so any element of one used with a group operation another element of one gets us something from one so that gave us something from one uh, so anything that's an uh, element of minus one acting on anything that's an element of minus one. So we're taking two things from minus one. Uh, so that gives us either E, which is from positive one, or it gives us this C3 bar, uh, which is from positive one. Uh, then the uh, consider this for if we're taking anything from, uh, from minus one and minus one. Uh, and so I, th I think I got that mixed around. So this one up here is minus one and minus one. This one is positive one and minus one. So uh, minus one and minus one will give us something from positive one. Uh, positive one and minus one will give us something from minus one. Uh, and so in the same way, we're doing this map of our uh, of our uh, set here, our invariant subset here, uh, and any of its elements. And we're taking this class here onto any of its elements and we maintain the group structure. So we're making this mapping right here. So this, these ones are going on to just the invariant subgroup and these ones are going on to the right coset of the invariant subgroup. Uh, where, uh, remember our our main group that we're taking these elements from uh, consists of these six elements. Uh, so the homomorphism of G which uh, we can denote as G bar has these elements and e these elements in here are called complexes. And so uh, when we're talking about these sort of higher order uh, or uh, I don't want to use the word order since that already actually has a meaning. So, uh, so this sort of higher type of, uh, of uh, group here that contains groups itself as its elements, we call those elements uh, complexes. And so 
we have this uh, this binary operation here is the same as taking any element from our invariant subgroup and any element from our uh, from our uh, right coset of that invariant subgroup, which remember had the three sigmas in it, uh, where this has the identity and then the C3 and C3 bar. And so we get a table that looks like this, which is very similar to this one up here, where we have on these on these sort of diagonal ones here, these positive ones. Uh, and so that's what these ones kind of represent. Uh, and then these ones on these sort of uh, off diagonal uh, are the negative ones, which are these right coset ones. Uh, and so th these homomorphisms uh, of our main group are actually isomorphisms of each other. Uh, and so a homomorphism, as I said, contains a different number of elements, but an isomorphism is between two groups that contain the same number of elements, i.e. they are one to one. And so we saw this, these two groups in an earlier video where uh, I talked about how these are both just kind of changing the names of the elements of these groups. And that's essentially what an isomorphism is, is you're just changing the names of elements in a group. And so that's why this table right here is an isomorphism of this table up here. Uh, but in, as we'll see in future videos, uh, these isomorphisms are important because that's how we actually uh, uh, try to get like matrix representations of our groups, but uh, I won't go into that just now. For now, it's just important to understand that an isomorphism is something where uh, we are mapping one group onto another, where each element of the first group is mapped onto one element of the other group, and it's one to one. So, uh, whatever order the first group was will be the order of the second group and so they'll have the same number of elements uh, but anyway i hope you found this video helpful and i will see you in the next one